So the tree of life that we see in the textbooks, um, that is a picture that everything started from one thing and all of this diversity and exquisite beauty that we see came from that one trunk, so to speak. So you're right. I mean, evolution would say there is only one tree and it all goes back to a single common ancestor, which is, you know, the base of the tree. Uh, but I would say, no, there's actually multiple trees. There's a felid tree, which has all the cats on it. There's the canid tree, which has all the dogs on it. There's the ursid tree, which has all the bears on it. There's the equid tree with all the horses on it, and so on and so forth. Each individual created kind, then, has its own individual tree, so that what you end up with is not one big tree of life. You end up with something like an orchard or a forest, where you have lots of different trees all growing together from the same created base. But this forest has trees that have a lot of branches on it, and that's that each kind now branching out into all of these different species that we see. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, they all start at creation, right? So they have that common beginning, but they're individual trees, so they're not all related to a common ancestor. They're all related to their own individual common ancestor, so the cat ancestor and the horse ancestor and whatnot. And so then they diversify over time, especially after the flood, when you have this period of massive upheaval when critters can change all over the place. And is that what the data shows us? I think so. I would start with uh, what I read in Genesis, which tells me about, you know, at the end of creation week, you have all these different creatures already there. You have flying things and swimming things and creeping things. And when I look at the data of nature, I see both similarity and difference. So an evolutionary biologist would say, look at all the similarity, and that puts everything on a common evolutionary tree. And I would say, yes, there is similarity, but there are also significant differences. And the significant differences, and this is really important, they end up exactly where I would expect them to. So I look at the Bible and I see flying things, swimming things, that sort of thing. But those are really big categories. I don't see it mentioning the individual species. You read through Genesis 1 and 2, you won't see lions and tigers and things like that. So it's got to be somewhere between, you know, bird and the individual species of bird. That's where I would expect to find these differences. That's where I find them over and over and over again. It's astonishing. And so, you know, I shouldn't be astonished, but I am. I, I, it always delights me when I think, hey, the Bible works. What do you know? Uh, but that's exactly how it works in this situation. I find these differences that essentially make sense of exactly what I'm seeing in the scripture. I'm seeing those differences right there where they should be. As a scientist, uh, looking at all of this data and everything that you see, it seems what you're saying is that the Genesis paradigm answers all of this data better. Yeah, I think so. I mean, ultimately, I think it does because it embraces both similarity and difference. Now, as we've already said, there's just, there's lots of questions that are still out there. Um, but uh, I'm pretty confident, given what our paradigm can explain, I'm very confident that those answers are going to be found.